Welcome to Atlantic Council Front Page, our premier platform for global leaders. It is our honor today to host Melanie Jolie, Foreign Minister of Canada, at a time of escalating historic challenge. In just a moment, conversation with CNN's Jim Shuto. I'm Fred Kemp, I'm President and CEO of the Atlantic Council, and we're coming to you from our Washington headquarters to our audience in our headquarters and around the world. Uh, this edition is also hosted by the Atlantic Council's Eurasia Center and its remarkable team by Ambassador John Herbst, which has been so effectively leading our work on Ukraine. At the Atlantic Council, we've not just been tracking this situation since Putin's February 24th invasion. Before then and since, we have worked across many of our 16 programs and centers to underscore the stakes for the future of the global order and the civilized world. Today, uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin announced that he would illegally annex nearly a fifth of Ukraine's territory in blatant violation of international law. That followed his mobilization of 300,000 Russian troops last week, which has been followed uh, by an exodus of Russian men, perhaps as many as 300,000 or more, from the country. And his threats of nuclear attack are only thinly veiled. Putin's annexation announcement made at the Kremlin today follows referendums in four occupied regions that have been almost universally dismissed as shams. Today as well, a Russian missile attack targeted and killed dozens of civilians in a civilian car convoy on the edge of one of those regions uh, preparing to deliver supplies to the occupied area. Responding to the attack, Ukraine President Zelensky called Russia a terrorist state and a bloodthirsty scum quote unquote, and said he had accelerated his application to join NATO. Uh, in short, this is a timely conversation. And it is in that context that Jim Shuto will lead a conversation with Minister Jolie. Canada was the first country to recognize Ukraine's independence in 1991. It was the first, by the way, as well, uh, to vote in favor of uh, Finland and Sweden's application to join NATO. Uh, uh, and has been, ever, has been a, a key leader uh, of Ukraine's uh, long before uh, the war uh, with a population uh, of 1.5 million Ukrainian Canadians. Uh, Minister Jolie and Canada have been at the forefront of providing diplomatic, economic, and military support in past months to fully restore Ukraine's sovereignty, territorial integrity, and targeting a broad swath of government and defense individuals and entities and state-sponsored disinformation and propaganda agents. Foreign Minister uh, Jolie, who has visited Ukraine twice already this year, has worked to guide Canadian foreign policy throughout this crisis. So we look forward to hearing uh, from her today. And it's my pleasure to hand it over to our moderator for today's discussion. Many of you know I worked for uh, 30 years for the Wall Street Journal. There's no better journalist in the business than Jim Shuto, anchor and chief national security correspondent for CNN, fine for foreign correspondent reporter for many years. Uh, Jim, take it away. Thanks so much, Fred. I appreciate the introduction. I'll try to live up to it. Uh, <laughs> thanks so much to you, Foreign Minister, for taking the time. I, I really have been looking forward to this conversation. Uh, to everyone here at the Atlantic Council with me in physical form and those joining us virtually, we appreciate having you in the conversation. If you want to join the conversation, please do use the hashtag AC front page. Uh, we want to expand this as best we can. Uh, appreciate the time. It's a pleasure, Jim. As, as I was you. telling you before we started, I got my start in news in Montreal, mm -hmm. and I still have uh, great memories from there, so it's a particular pleasure to, pleasure to sit down next to you. Well, it's a pleasure, and I, you know, it's, it's great that we both agree on the fact that Montreal is the best city on earth. It, it, it is. I'm a New Yorker, so I will place that <laughs> close, but, 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 I am, but I am a big fan of Montreal. Um, we begin on a day, as Fred was mentioning, with, with an enormous amount of news, and frankly, frightening news, uh, mm -hmm. given the comments from, from the Russian president today. So first, mm -hmm. With his annexation, in, in which he says that this is Russian territory forever, his words, 
Do you, does Canada expect Russia to now militarily escalate its war even further in Ukraine? Well, um, of course, I think we, we have to take what is happening extremely seriously. But meanwhile, we will never recognize mm -hmm. the sham referendums. We will never recognize the annexation of Zaporizhia, uh, Luhansk, and Donetsk. This, these are Ukraine. Uh, these are Ukrainian territories. We've been clear about that. And therefore, our strategy won't change. Mm -hmm. And that's important for uh, the world to know. And it's uh, exactly what uh, Tony Blinken and I just said in a press conference before this interview. Your strategy won't change. Are you concerned that Putin's strategy will change, or at least his tactics? Well, what we saw, mm -hmm. particularly with the mobilization of 300,000 mm -hmm. Uh, man is a sign of failure because his war, Putin's war of choice, was uh, was a strategic error. Mm. And so, uh, what is he doing right now? He's creating even more turmoil within his country. Mm. Um, you know, Fred was talking about it at the beginning. It's not only 300 men that have been mobilized, but what we're seeing is that also lots of uh, Russian dissidents are leaving. Mm -hmm. And so this is not a special operation anymore. This is a war against a sovereign neighbor, and this is against international law. Secretary General of the, uh, of the uh, UN have, has been clear. Even yesterday, he tweeted about the fact that this was clearly against international law. So of course, we have to continue to stand uh, by the fact that uh, by, by these uh, Ukrainians that are fighting for their lives and freedom uh, on, on Ukrainian territory as we speak. We, we've heard U.S. officials quite deliberately, it seems, speak in public in a way that to date it seems they've only spoken in private about the risk of a nuclear strike by, by Russia and, and reveal publicly that they have had direct communications with Russian officials for some time about this and how severe the consequences would be. In, in your judgment, that possibility increased in recent days and weeks. Well, obviously, uh, just even using a nuclear threat is in itself extremely irresponsible, but it's unthinkable because nobody wins out of uh, any form of, uh, of nuclear war. Uh, but yes, we've been in close contact with the Americans. We have been within the G7 having these conversations, and we need to plan. And that's, that's exactly what we've been doing. You mean you need to plan for the possibility that he does use them? Of course, mm -hmm. we do. Do you uh, subscribe to the view that Putin cannot lose from his perspective? He may be losing, but that from his point of view, he can't concede defeat. You know, I, I can't talk for, yeah. for Putin, and I won't talk for, uh, on behalf of the Russians. This is a conversation that will happen within Russia. Mm. Meanwhile, we have to stand uh, uh, for the right thing. Uh, the, 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 we have to make the right choices, and we've been steadfast in our support on the Canadian side. Um, our role since the beginning has been so from the beginning where you know there was this entire declassification strategy mm -hmm. Jim that was yeah. well done mm -hmm. it was well done for three reasons why because it was really bringing people around the world much more aware of what was going on it was yeah. helping bringing Europe and, and the US together and us and the UK which is not part of the European Union mm -hmm. we all know that mm -hmm. and also um, uh, clearly helping Ukrainians themselves to know what was going on. Um, but what we did was really to uh, use my French. <laughs> Please, I'll, <laughs> and, I'll try to keep up. No, no, but <laughs> uh, be closer to France, be closer mm -hmm. to Germany, be closer to these countries to make sure that we would have a strong bond. And also, uh, and Frank, uh, Fred mentioned it a bit earlier, we have 1.5 million Canadians uh, that are of Ukrainian uh, mm. descent in Canada. We have that expertise. We've been training Ukrainian forces in Ukraine since 2014. We, before the war, we had trained 30,000 of them, and now we are continuing to train them. So basically, we have to pursue to continue the course like we've done since the beginning of this mm. invasion. And that's why Ukrainians know, and the West can know, that they can count on Canada's support. The, the declassification early on, I certainly appreciate it as someone who covers the intelligence mm -hmm. agencies here, but also was, was in Ukraine, and it gave a vision, certainly, of, of that Russian yeah. buildup and, and attempts at false flag operations, et cetera, and took the wind out of a lot of those exactly. operations. Uh, 
U.S. officials have described, I mean, you heard Blinken, for instance, this past weekend, uh, serious consequences if Russia were to go nuclear in its war mm -hmm. there. Uh, and I deliberately, right, not describing those consequences in uh, the entire menu of, of things. Course. But can you give us, given, given the closeness of the relationship and the cooperation, can you give it, what are serious consequences? I won't go into a mm -hmm. military strategy or any form of um, hypothesis. I think it would be unreasonable and unwise on my part. Uh, but the goal is to maintain, uh, sh we need to isolate diplomatically, politically, and economically Russia. And we need to continue to send more weapons to Ukraine, and we need to send more money to uh, mm -hmm. Ukraine and, and strong sanctions. That's exactly also why today I announced 35 uh, sanctions on hmm. um, Russians uh, that were at the core of organizing the sham referenda, mm -hmm. and also uh, 43 new oligarchs. Yeah, we covered those this morning as they yeah. broke. Uh, before I get to those, because I do want to ask about the effects of those particular sanctions, uh, on, on, again, on the, the nuclear issue, I've heard discussion of a strike or action by Russia that is short of, of a use of nuclear weapons, like a tactical nuclear weapon, a battlefield nuke, that kind of thing, or something that, that is still in that category. For instance, a more catastrophic attack on the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, right, which would be, you know, some have described it as, as a dirty bomb, right, in, in effect. Mm -hmm. is, is this a possibility that, that Canadian officials and others uh, and its partners consider seriously? Well, we're, we're very concerned with uh, the Zaporizhia uh, nuclear plant, obviously. Mm -hmm. We've been supporting the IEA, -E, mm -hmm. and so the organization in charge of uh, um, nuclear energy. Um, and we very much know that the uh, Zaporizhia nuclear plant is in a so-called annexed territory now, and therefore there is a, an increased risk. So I'm uh, in close contact with uh, our intelligence services and as well as our uh, key allies on this one. Okay, so on the sanctions, it is a familiar combination of things, individuals and entities, those involved in, in, in war-connected activities, you know, whether you're trading, um, trading, trading in arms or further restricting Russia's ability to get the weapons or the mm -hmm. things they need for their weapons, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. To date, that has not moved Putin. It certainly punished his economy and it's restricted his access to these things, but it hasn't changed his strategic calculus, however failed that calculus is. Why, why should we have confidence that this collection of things will change the progress and, and, and the apparent escalation of the war? Mm -hmm. Well, a couple of things on that. On sanctions themselves, mm -hmm. we have passed a legislation in Canada. We're the first country in the world to pass a leg this legislation to make sure that we can not only seize these sanctions uh, assets, but we can sell them mm -hmm. and to use the proceeds to uh, compensate yeah. victims and also help reconstruction of Ukraine. So we are now in the midst of uh, drafting the regulations to put that into place. I know Congress is having conversations about a similar type of, op uh, of legislation. We're the first one to uh, go ahead, so we want to do it well. But this is certainly uh, taking a lot of my attention mm -hmm. as foreign minister. The other thing also is we know that the, there are compounded effects to, first, the fact that we've been uh, really sending heavy weapons. Why? Well, uh, we know that there is a partial uh, uh, mobilization. <coughs> Therefore, uh, more Russians are frustrated yeah. with, the, uh, with their uh, governments themselves. Mm. Uh, th itself. Uh, also, uh, what we've done is we've been able, because of our strong sanctions within the West, first, to stay united. Mm -hmm. Second, there is clearly no Russian cheap energy going to Europe, yeah. um, and therefore we're isolating also economically Russia. And uh, there's a thousand businesses that have left already uh, uh, Russia. So bit by bit, mm. this is clearly affecting their mm. economy. They are also cornered when it comes to their technology sector. So these are having, uh, these are all destabilizing uh, ev events, definitely for the Kremlin. Over time, I imagine, also imposing heavy costs, particularly on Europe. I mean, the, the world energy markets, uh, the prices are up partly because of this, uh, or perhaps largely because of the problems in Ukraine, but mm -hmm. you know, winter is coming, as they say, mm -hmm. to Europe here. Do, are you confident that European and Western unity will survive that? That you won't have folks peeling off and say the costs are simply too high? Mm -hmm. We need to. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Um, but what I'm hearing from my uh, foreign minister colleagues and friends mm -hmm. is that the resolve is extremely strong. Mm -hmm. uh, the European Union itself has been organizing uh, the entire uh, question of energy security within the European Union. Um, the um, German Chancellor was in Canada for a week-long visit, end of August. Mm -hmm. Um, on the energy security side, we've increased our production. Uh, we've also made sure that we will really put forward this important uh, LNG plant, which will yeah. be ready by 2025 in Kitsmat, BC. So it's not for the East Coast, but it's it will have an impact by increasing supply. The you know in the global markets exactly uh, cost will will uh, be be lower. And finally, uh, we sign a very important hydrogen. Uh, uh, deal with the Germans because we want to be there short term, we want to be there, you know, on the middle term, but really on the longer term. Yeah. Because what is happening across Europe is, yes, going through the next winter, but they're not going back to Russia's mm. uh, cheap gas. They are looking for this transition. They're thinking ahead. And so that's why Canada will be that uh, really important energy producer and exporter in a low carbon world. Do you worry about the countries in Europe that have shown some affinity, at, at, even recently, for Putin and, and for right-wing leaders, if you think of an Orban in Hungary or the, the new uh, putative prime minister or, or likely prime minister in Italy, that if the bulk of the alliance remains uni uni unified mm -hmm. on support for Ukraine and on basically biting the bullet on, on higher energy costs, that, that you might have some peel away? Well. We're politicians. We yeah. have to be in, in, in contact with what our populations are t is telling mm. us. But obviously, we're following closely what's going on. I haven't uh, uh, talked to my uh, f you know, counterpart from Italy. I don't mm. know yet who's that person. Uh, I'll be in contact. Uh, definitely what we've done through this crisis, Jim, is to reinforce the G7. Mm -hmm. So the G7 has become this coordination group where we organize, plan, scenarios uh, and uh, m many of the different uh, uh, decisions that you've seen yeah. have been uh, through the G7. Um, but at the same time, we need to be there for Europeans mm -hmm. and uh, we'll be there. Looking at energy, is there any doubt who's behind the attacks on the pipeline in the north? I've been talking, there have been confident statements about it being sabotage. You've mm -hmm. heard that from Western leaders there. Who did it? So. Um, I spoke to my Danish counterpart and my mm. Swedish counterpart yesterday. Um, you saw the European Union's uh, announcement regarding, indeed, the sabotage of mm -hmm. Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2. Mm. Um, and so I spoke about it with uh, Tony Blinken a bit earlier today. Uh, and you saw NATO's statement. Yeah. So uh, at this point, we're still investigating. Mm -hmm. But obviously, we want to make sure that we do things in the right way. But we're not naive. Right. You're not naive as to who's behind it. I won't, like I told you, mm -hmm. we won't speculate, but at the same time, we want to make sure that uh, the world needs to understand that this is a very important European infrastructure yeah. that was sabotaged. Uh, Nord Stream 2 had no gas in it. Uh, actually, um, it never went through following the invasion. Yeah. Um, but also Nord Stream 1, no gas was flowing to Europe but there was gas in the pipeline, and definitely that's why there are so many images showing gas and methanes uh, you know, coming out of, of the Baltic Sea as we speak because of the sabotage. I, when we think of, and, and again, this is trying to get inside someone's head uh, when I speak about Putin and what he might do next. I thought you were talking about me. Well, I try, I, try, I try to do that as well. It's part of my job. But uh, you can't do that, but you can look at his track record. Right, and here is someone who not only invaded Ukraine, uh, but committed war crimes there yeah. multiple times. Yeah. Ordered the, and, and it continues. I mean, the, the accounts from Bucha and elsewhere are, are horrendous. Mm -hmm. So when we hear comments from him today saying, I'm annexing this territory illegally, uh, it is Russian territory, mm -hmm. and we will use all means to defend it as Russian territory, mm -hmm. where do you put the chances of uh, an escalation, I mean, you said unthinkable, right? But, mm -hmm. but it, is it truly unthinkable that, that he would use a nuclear strike? Well, he has a very dangerous rhetoric. Mm -hmm. 
and his actions are extremely dangerous. So that's why we have to stay united. And we have to stay united in the West, but there we, we need to also reach out to the Global South. Yeah. Because uh, there is a lot of disinformation happening. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one of the reasons why I'm going to the OAS mm -hmm. next week with Tony Blinken, and we'll be meeting with a lot of our colleagues from Latin America. Mm -hmm. We know that disinformation campaigns launched by, launched by Russia have been uh, really uh, feeding on this anti-American sentiment that is that is already you know there in Latin America, saying that the food the, the, the food shortages or the food high prices are are linked to uh, the sanctions by by the U.S., by Canada, and, and by the West. So we need to show up. We need to be there to offer. Uh, funding. Uh, we need to uh, be there to offer concretely solutions. We're a very important agricultural power. Mm -hmm. We've increased our, uh, our production. We've in we will be uh, signing deals on fertilizers also. So we're in solution mode. Um, but that's the case for Latin America. That's the case also for Africa and Asia. And so Putin's war of choice in Ukraine is having an, uh, an impact around the world. And uh, the world is facing compounded crisis from uh, global cha uh, climate change, obviously, but also the pandemic and now the impacts of the food crisis. All that to say, more than ever, we need to show up. We need to be there. We need to be united. And this is a, this is a test for us, yeah. amongst us, but also with others. And we will be there uh, to make sure that we step up to the plate. You talk about disinformation in South America. The sad fact is, I mean, I, I've covered dis, disinformation as a journalist uh, emanating from Russia and China, particularly during the 2016 election mm -hmm, and, and, mm -hmm. and afterwards. But one of the most disturbing things to me is how much is homegrown. And mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the narratives you just described, you could just as easily find on some US outlets and, and, and from mm -hmm. commentators, et cetera. When you look down from the north mm -hmm. and see that, what's your reaction? Well, uh, I said in my speech today with, to with Tony Blinken that uh, um, President Biden said that he was going to be fighting for the soul of his nation. Mm -hmm. uh, he gave an important speech back in, in August. Um, we know that this information is happening in our own country. We know that um, our institutions are being challenged. We, we can't be immune. We're not immune to what is going on uh, what we're seeing in the U.S. and what is, we're, we're seeing elsewhere in the world. So we have to make sure that um, people uh, value democracy, but uh, we have to do it with, with them because at the end of the day, democracy is based on trust. Yeah. And so as a government, actually, we have to show up and make sure that we offer solutions for inflation and for the uh, economic ch challenges that uh, Canadians are, are, are going through and suffering from. Um, and at the same time, we need to make sure that government works um, because following the, the pandemic, there's definitely frustrations. Um, and, and so that's why we're in solution mode. We, are ex we want to make sure that we're extremely proactive. Uh, and on the question of disinformation itself, uh, also, we need to make sure that we up our game in terms of cyber security uh, and cyber intelligence and working with allies because there's a war happening in Ukraine, but there's a war on information happening around the world, and there's an economic war also that is happening between, you know, against the West. Mm -hmm. So this is the reality, and the, you know, what I would say to that, Jim, is the post-Cold War era is over. Yeah. Things have changed, yeah. and we have to reckon it. I, I'm 100% on the same page with, with that. When you meet with, with U.S. officials like, like Tony Blinken, and, mm -hmm. and you see the, the Biden administration, they're, they're, they have returned to precedent right, on a number of things, commitment to NATO and, and relationship with Canada. I mean, there, there were some difficult times uh, mm -hmm. during the previous administration between U.S. and Canada. Do you, though, and do you and your colleagues and, and fellow ministers of government worry that that's action, whatever the outcome is, but that, but that commitments that used to be bipartisan and would survive election cycles don't necessarily do so? I mean, there, there were, if you listen to John Bolton, 
the U.S. would have pulled out of NATO had the, other, had the past election not gone the way that it went. Mm -hmm. So as a close ally and neighbor, do you listen to the commentary or, or the commitments you get today and say, well, that's good for now. We'll see in two years. So a, quick, a couple of things. On, mm -hmm. on the question of NATO itself, I think that President Putin reinforced NATO yeah. more than Strong. anything. Yeah. So uh, I think it was an unintended consequences that, from his part, but I think uh, we've been able uh, to, uh, to basically be more united than ever. Mm -hmm. Nothing like having one villain to be all against. Um, on the question of what is happening here, um, one of the reasons why I'm in Washington right now is definitely to understand uh, what will happen in, with the midterms. Yeah. Uh, I met with uh, Senator Romney, I met with Senator um, Kane and, and Senator Menendez and, and, uh, and, and a couple of, of different key Congress people. Mm. Um, and also, obviously, we have in mind 2024 mm. uh, because we must be resilient. Yeah. So I'm in charge of uh, making sure we have a strong relationship between U.S. and Canada, but also we're very much eyes of wide open. Mm. I've spoken, I spoke this week with a Republican lawmaker who has been very pro-Ukraine, who said, you know, the most likely outcome of this election, where, where Republicans uh, take the House, and it, who knows what happens in the Senate, but that's also possible. But regardless, this lawmaker said that, listen, the, you know, there are parts of my party who are far less committed to this, and you know, the, you, you know the, you're familiar with the isolationist wing of, of the Republican Party. Do you have the same fear that post-election you won't have the same bipartisan unity on support for Ukraine from the U.S. side? At this point, that's not what I'm seeing. I'm mm -hmm. seeing that there is strong support, uh, and I heard that from the Democrats, obviously, mm -hmm. but I heard that also from the Republicans. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's interesting to hear. Do, when I, I, I referenced some difficulties between Canada and the U.S. during the previous administration. Mm -hmm. I was somewhat involved in one of them because I wrote a book and in it I had a long interview with Peter Navarro in which he disparaged the U.S. relationship with Canada and Canada's commitment to the U.S. as an ally, and he, you know, basically saying, you know, the Canadians just glom on to us when they need something and forgetting that, that mm -hmm. uh, and, and from Afghanistan, right? I mean, I, I embedded in Afghanistan with U.S. forces many times and off, often saw mm -hmm. Canadian troops on the front line. So we know that's not true, but he said it, and it's out mm -hmm. there. Has the, has the, has the U.S.-Canadian relationship repaired itself after that? Well, I think uh, that we have a good USMCA, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that it's a very progressive one. Mm -hmm. um, I think, indeed, that we uh, fought for our values and for a way of lives on many battlefields together, mm -hmm. but also, I would say, that the U.S. exports more goods to Canada yeah than to China, the UK, um, and uh, Japan, uh, you know, all together. So, you know, it's $2 billion worth of trade per day. Yeah. This is fundamental for uh, half of all the United States. Mm -hmm. So I think it transcends administrations and political parties. Definitely that's the case back home because there's strong support for trade mm -hmm. on uh, all the political spectrum. But, uh, you know, uh, as, a, as a government, this is clearly a priority, and that's why I'm here. Understood. Okay. I have been, I've observed a, a number of times where the U.S. has tried to pivot from Europe to China mm -hmm. in, 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 ter in national security terms and a mm -hmm. whole host of terms, mm -hmm. and is often diverted by events, right? 9-11, uh, you know, the fall of, Af you know, po the, after the withdrawal of Afghanistan from Iraq and Afghanistan, well, the first withdrawal from Afghanistan, from Iraq, rather, and, and each of those attempts failed, and now you have a war in Europe, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you have a World War II-like conflict in Europe today that, that but by some accounts, has again um, diverted that, that turn or that um, rebalancing to Asia. From, from Canada's perspective, who is the bigger threat, Russia or China, na in <laughs> national security terms? Uh, well, I think, first and foremost, um, we are an Indo-Pacific country. Mm -hmm. We haven't defined ourselves as an Indo-Pacific country f f since our, the beginning of our history. Um, we've always invested a lot in the transatlantic uh, relationship. And, you know, even many of my former... This will be a comprehensive strategy talking about many different aspects of our relationship uh, with this particular region. 
Uh, and I had a long conversation with uh, Secretary Blinken about that uh, just a couple of hours ago because obviously we're in close contact with uh, our American friends, but also uh, we know that other countries in the world are working on their own China policy, particularly Germany and South Korea. So I've had conversations with them as well. I love the way that you say turning west because, of course, it is. I west. know. <laughs> but from the U.S. perspective, we often say east, although we have a west coast facing China. But anyway, uh, we're stuck in our old, our old thinking, uh, European thinking on that. So, I mean, listen, the way you're describing that, it sounds like you're saying that, that it, you, you don't want it to be an entirely hostile relationship by any means. Well, I, I think that we have to make mm -hmm. sure that, first and foremost, we assess what's going on in China. Mm -hmm. And there's a very important Communist Party meeting happening mm -hmm. October 16, and we're following very, very closely. Uh, we know we're dealing with a very much assertive China under Xi Jinping. Uh, we know also that um, we, we have to uh, make sure that we, uh, we uh, recognize the importance of international rules uh, in the sense that, uh, for example, the Taiwan Strait is an international strait. That's yeah. exactly why an American frigate and a Canadian frigate went through mm -hmm. the passage a, a week ago. I noted that the Canadians were there. So um, that being said, we uh, will continue uh, to work with China on climate change issues and on health issues, mm -hmm. because these are cross-border issues. And uh, we will be hosting the COP15 conference in the beautiful city of Montreal. Mm. Uh, this I'm coming. <laughs> <laughs> in December, it's on biodiversity. It was supposed to be hosted in China, mm. but because of their zero COVID policy and because the UN Secretariat on Biodiversity is in Montreal are gathering the world on this very issue um, in, in December. So um, it is important that we continue our diplomatic ties but at the same time, we need to be uh, clear in terms of how things are evolving in the Indo-Pacific. I, I read an interesting and, and somewhat contrarian analysis of the war in Ukraine as it relates to China, which made the argument that the, the U.S.-NATO investment there has actually been pretty manageable, right, in terms of weapons and finances. Strong, but pretty manageable, and no, no troops, you know, thankfully, yet. To, to the point where actually it makes it easier for the U.S. and the West to pivot to China than not. In, in other words, that Ukraine has borne the, the, the burden here of, of really defanging Russia's military mm -hmm. threat to Europe, you know, except from nuclear, but, but has basically dismantled its, its entire ability to carry out a ground offensive and, and sort of burnt down the paper tiger, if you want to say that, for, in terms of how the West and NATO looks at the Russian military with a relatively small investment from the U.S. and its allies like Canada and NATO, which makes it easier to actually transition to and, and, and counter the China threat. And I wonder if that makes sense to you. Well, I told you a bit earlier in this interview that the G7 has become this coordination group. I think um, I, we're, what, at the 12th meeting at this point. Uh, we've been really, really dealing with just, just the issue of stability and peace in the world. Yeah. And the problem we have is that when rules are not followed and when uh, multilateralism fails, well, then we are in much more of a dangerous and, uh, world. We're, Ukraine is the biggest security threat since the Second World War. But obviously, we know that what is happening in the Indo-Pacific needs our attention. And I would say uh, for Canada also, it's what's going on in the Arctic. And we need to make sure that we uh, are uh, really um, uh, having a, a forward-leaning uh, approach when it comes to the Arctic. And so next year, the G7 will be hosted by Japan. Of course, this conversation about the Indo-Pacific will be front and center. Meanwhile, I'll be heading to uh, Japan and Korea in 10 days. Uh, and so I'll be having lots of conversations with my counterparts because we need to make sure also that the Northern Pacific, which is our neighborhood yeah. for Canada, is a safe place. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on the Arctic. I, I went on a submarine exercises up there and, and saw the increasing competition, both in terms of trade and, and, and mm -hmm. military competition there. On the environment, if I can, given mm -hmm. COP, uh, COP is coming up, and I remember the coverage last year, does the world have this? 
<laughs> right? I mean, you, you did finally have the U.S. make some sort of, you know, significant, mm -hmm. quite significant, mm -hmm. historically the biggest investment in, in green technologies, renewable energy, that kind of thing. But if you look at the science, you know, the, the, the temperature is rising. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're not taking the steps necessary to keep mm -hmm. the temperature under that one and a half degree, is mm -hmm. it one and a half, two degree range. What's your level of confidence? Well, listen, we just went through uh, Hurricane Fiona in Canada, and you folks are dealing with uh, yeah. Hurricane Ian right now. Um, so climate change is not on the horizon. It's here. It's here, and we have to deal with it. Um, that is why we've put a price on pollution back home. We've been uh, steadfast in our commitment to fight against climate change. It's been tough. It is, transition is not easy, particularly for the people working in uh, the sector, but we are now seeing the first big investments of uh, our, um, our history in low carbon emission energy. The hydrogen plant uh, that uh, Germany is uh, investing in, in Stevensville, uh, Newfoundland, is basically complete, is, 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 is a new way of dealing with things in Canada, particularly and particularly for Newfoundland. Um, we are uh, there is the, so and, and like I said a bit earlier, Jim, um, Europe is going very fast on energy transition because they're not going back uh, on to cheap Russian gas, and basically they want to be able to make sure that it makes sense for them on a political level, but also on an economic level. So I think that Canada has taken tough decisions, but at the same time, I think we're in the right direction. And obviously, I, as for COP, which will be happening in Egypt, um, we will be you know, leading the way. And, uh, and that's why it's important to bring China along. It's so important. What's the thing? Are you confident that two, the world's two biggest polluters are going to do what's necessary, China and the U.S.? Well, I think the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, will continue to do it. I, I'm confident that the Biden administration will make it uh, uh, really a, a priority. I've had conversations with uh, John Kerry about it. Mm -hmm. uh, also, my colleague, Minister of the Environment, Stephen Gilbo, mm -hmm. Uh, has been uh, very much involved with, in this conversation. But meanwhile, Jim, um, and the UK as well, and you know, uh, many other countries, but I, I must say that China needs to be at the table. That's the only way we'll be able to achieve our, our objectives. This is existential for us. And um, it's existential for us, but uh, it is existential for so many small countries uh, and the other thing, I know I'm, I'm bringing it another subject, but um, I said that in my UN speech late, earlier this week, we need to reform our international financial system to help these small island states that are dealing with the impacts of climate change, because when we do not do, when we don't do so, um, well, they, they uh, lose confidence in the West, yeah. and that's a problem. Yeah. They feel like they're bearing the costs, but no one's paying the price. I, listen, I thought yeah. of that when I was looking at coastal areas of Florida this morning, and even from previous storms, right? I mean, what, what is, or you go back to Louisiana, what is, is it smart to rebuild in some of those areas, right, which will be constantly threatened? It's a big yeah. decision. It's tough. And meanwhile, people are suffering from what's going on. Mm -hmm. And so we have to be empathetic. We have to be there. We have to offer them solutions. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and meanwhile, we have to be resilient. Do when when you leave Washington? Yeah. Do you did, did you come here to ask for something, and are you leaving with what you wanted? <laughs> <laughs> That's the word. I came here really, like I said, to understand yeah. what's the political dynamics yeah. come with the midterms happening. Uh, so what was your conclusion leaving here? Well, uh, you know, it's uh, it's it's interesting to see. I don't think that I was able to have a. a uh, a, a, a clear results in Are you in mind. A bet as you leave <laughs> uh, I can I can do a bet with you, okay. but not publicly. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but also, uh, the goal was really to exchange information, exchange ideas as well, uh, and to reaffirm our strong cooperation, mm -hmm. and that's the goal. Uh, and I look forward also to having uh, Secretary Blinken coming to Canada. On, on if I could ask about an issue that, that has been primarily a U.S. both 
well, policy issue, but also certainly political issue, but one that has kind of bled over into Canada, and that is the refugee crisis. And some have mm -hmm. you know, come from the south and go all the way to the Canadian border. Do, do you speak to, to the U.S. to U.S. officials about how to respond to this jointly, and, and, and what do, what do you ask from the U.S. side? Well, there is a safe third country agreement that is mm -hmm. important between Canada and the U.S., and we've been uh, actively working with them to modernize it. Uh, meanwhile, I think. Obviously, we're dealing with the effects of the migrant crisis. We need to look at the causes. Yeah. And one of the things that Canada has been leading on is really the conversation about Haiti. Uh, because we know that what is happening in Haiti mm. is having an impact around yeah. our hemisphere and definitely in the US and even back home. Uh, so we have to um, be stronger and on Monday about this very issue. We have been leading this conversation, uh, and we're in close contact uh, with particularly the U.S. and France on this issue. But uh, my goal is at the uh, OAS next week to hold a conversation, uh, a meeting uh, with the AT uh, members, but also with key OAS members okay. about uh, the issue, obviously. Forgive me, I meant to ask you this earlier on, on the subject of Ukraine. In, yep. in the wake of Putin's annexation, uh, com you know, in quotes, uh, signing decree, mm -hmm. uh, the Ukrainian president immediately said, we're, we're applying for uh, accelerated membership yep. in NATO. Is that a reality? I mean, because as I keep reminding people, once that happens, Russia's at war with NATO as well because of the mutual defense commitment. Is that, is that a... Well, on the question of NATO and Ukraine, we've mm -hmm. said many yeah. times in the past, we are in favor of their accession right. to NATO. But how do you do that and avoid a broader war? Well, or do you not avoid a broader war? Uh, at this point, we want to make sure that we do things mm -hmm. to, uh, to avoid, obviously, an international conflict. Um, but meanwhile, this is so fundamental because if we accept that a neighbor uh, mm -hmm. can, uh, well, is, is not done. standing, yeah. it's done. Mm -hmm. uh, so we want to make sure that uh, we continue to work on the diplomatic side, on the economic side, and definitely on the military side. What, speaking, just connecting the dots between China and Russia before we go, mm -hmm. is China, when they look at the experience of Russia and Ukraine and the world's response, more or less likely to take military action to take Taiwan? I won't speculate on that, and you know I won't answer that mm -hmm. directly. Well, should but, they be? Should they be? But I've told you already that uh, the Taiwan Strait is, is an international strait. Yeah. So that's why we went through it with the Americans recently. That's why we'll continue to go. That's why other frigates from other countries will go. And meanwhile, we uh, will uh, en engage with China, um, but we will make sure that the West in general mm -hmm. engages with China because we need to make sure that um, that we um, obviously help Ukraine fight this existential war, mm -hmm. uh, but prosperity for Chinese, prosperity for Americans, prosperity for Canadians mm -hmm. is all linked to the fact that we have stability and we need to make yeah. sure that there is stability. Rule of law. Okay, and final, rule of law. Final question is the toughest yeah. question. So your team, the Montreal Expos, are now the Washington Nationals. Are, are you a Nationals fan? Oh, my God, this is so difficult. <laughs> I can't believe you're asking me that I question. I mean, it's the best you have. I mean, right? Oh. Unless you're a Blue Jays fan, which I would I'm find leaving amazing. this. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but for real, mm -hmm. I thought you would be asking me questions about the Montreal Canadians, and I was ready, but not the Montreal there, Expos. Do, do Canadians play hockey? I, I forget. <laughs> okay, sorry. I spent enough time there to know that's the religion. Uh, uh, Foreign Minister Jolie, thanks so much for taking it. It was time. a pleasure. Thanks so much. Well, Thank appreciate you. it. And thanks so much to all of you for Thank joining you. us today. Thank you. Thank uh you. -huh.